Hello and welcome to the first episode of Behind the Bib. I'm your host, Tommy Kasher, and today we're going Behind the Bib with Kalia Stanton. Kalia Stanton joining me all the way from rainy Perth. Mate, how's it going? I'm going good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the on the podcast. No worries. Mate, first episode. Thank you so much. Uh, what would you have for breakfast? Um, I had really boring breakfast. I had toast um, with some spreads on top. But uh, yesterday was a much more exciting day. I had a breakfast pocket. So I'm all about food. So you could literally talk to me about food for hours on end. Talk to me about a breakfast pocket. What does that involve? Um, it's basically a pizza fold over in half with some barbecue sauce, a really nice oozy goozy cheese. We've got some bacon and egg, um, smash a bit of tomato in there if you feel like it. But yeah, it's a breakfast pocket. It's just, you know. That's a vibe. All about it. So it's yeah, ki- totally, totally. So it's kind of like a breakfast burrito slash pita that's kind of like you got your bread and then some fillings inside? Yeah, exactly right. Matt, what's a normal breakfast for you when you're like in season, sort of you got your training schedule going on? What's a normal breakfast for you? Yeah, so it, it mixes up depending on what we've got um, training-wise. So if we've got something like gym, obviously a little bit lighter just because we don't need to obviously have so much um, to fuel our bodies. And then when it comes to a proper training session, when you're going for two, two and a half hours, probably something a little bit more carb-heavy. So porridge or scrambled eggs and avocado on toast. Um, I've been really getting into the – I call it baked eggs, but it's not baked at all. It's actually – quite opposite it's um a bit of a like what is it i'm gonna pronounce it wrong so i do apologize to anyone who knows how to say it but like the charcuterie type oh yeah shashu um, i think charcuterie is it i don't think so i think that's a cheese board oh okay right is that what we're talking confused. about yeah that's what i thought you meant <laughs> no that's the issue that this is i have these issues no it's um baked eggs so basically it's um tomato passata with some basil um, some goat's feta or something like really creamy, um, some chili flakes, um, and yeah, just cook them around with some garlic and stuff. Mate, how do you deal with spice? Do you like hot food? Since I've moved over to Melbourne, I have become so much better. But to cut a very long story short, I used to not be able to tolerate sweet chili sauce. So we've progressed to chili flakes, which I feel like is a really big step. Yeah, it is. What initiated that over in Melbourne? Um, I think the people I'm living with tend to have chili with quite a lot of things. Okay. And I started in Perth with having a family not really that, you know, used to chili and also didn't kind of grow up with it either. And then since I've moved to Melbourne, it's just kind of been forced upon me um, in a way just with little things and added it on the side to little dishes and then slowly incorporating it into foods and then me not realizing that it's actually there. I I love chili because it's almost like a challenge in the meal. Like how hot can you go before it ruins the food? We've got like a fried chicken place near us here in Newcastle and I always go for hot, this hot the hot fried chicken as opposed to mild or medium, whatever you want to call it. But some days I can't handle it and other days I can. I really enjoy the challenge because I enjoy it spicy, but sometimes, you know, when it gets too hot and it ruins the meal, Oh, I 100% know. I'm, I'm pretty much a temperature gauge when it comes to spice for um, a fellow netballer, Courtney Bruce, who you might have um, interviewed previously. Yes. And her spice level is not very good. So I'm usually the determiner when we go out right. to dinner together and we've got something. She'll, tell, she'll be like, can you just try this and see if it's a bit too spicy for me? Otherwise, we have to, you know, usher the waiter over and get some yogurt on the table. <laughs> oh, mate. Okay, so Courtney Bruce is a great segue here. So season 2021. Now, let's talk about it. what were your feelings once you made the move across to Melbourne? Obviously, you'd played your whole career so far. Was it seven seasons with Fever? Yeah, seven seasons. Yep. So going into my eighth season with a different team, obviously completely different experience. Um, and yeah, very excited by it as well. Yeah. So initially when you were like signing the contract with the Vixens, you obviously had lived in Perth. You had such great friends over there, your family support network. What were your initial feelings heading over? Um, truly excited and really surprised that they wanted to take me on board. 
I never thought that I would get the opportunity to play for another team. And I didn't know at the time that this was on the cards. It came really from left field. And I had no idea that this was going to be um, the option for me in 2021. Um, I was really open to moving and really open to a new opportunity, wherever that happened to, to be. Um, and obviously very, very grateful. That was probably the overarching thing is just really humbled by the opportunity to play um, with the Melbourne Vixens. And I hold them in really high regard, still do. Um, but coming into the team was just really, really excited to be able to play with some of the world's best players. What makes you say that you didn't think you'd have an opportunity with another team? Um, I think just coming from one club and playing with them for such a long period of time. And obviously I don't take playing professionally lightly. And I think it's such a fantastic opportunity for someone in my position. Um, and yeah, to play seven years, I thought that was pretty good. And um, yeah, to be able to end up playing even longer, um, I was just really grateful. And obviously down the line as well, when you have most people signed at most clubs as well, the pool of people to choose from is considerably less, but also the options as a player from the other side of it is considerably less as well. So they obviously had a lot of options to choose from um, within their own pathway. And I thought given the Vixens and knowing the history of how they, you know, do their team list and selection, it's usually from within their pathway. So to go outside of that, um, I felt was kind of a different choice that they hadn't necessarily done pre- prior to that moment. Um, so yeah, just really grateful. Wow, that's such a fascinating insight. I never, I guess I would have thought any player would have been like, yep, I knew that I could have gone anywhere. And like you said, you were happy to go anywhere. But the fact that you didn't necessarily expect it, I find that so fascinating. I guess that's why I like having these conversations, just getting inside and behind the bib, as the title suggests. Um, yeah, well well plugged. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's definitely different. I think... I probably didn't think about things the way I I probably don't think about things the way most um, people do as well. I'm very creative um, and I come from a different background as well. My life doesn't revolve around netball solely. I have other interests as well. And I think for me, that's kind of where I was at as well in my head that I just finished my double degree in nutrition health promotion and was thinking maybe this is that next step for me. And potentially this is, um, you know, that new phase in my career whether that was you know in sports some other direction um but potentially not professionally so I was a bit of a crossroads when I was let go from fever and didn't really know where that was going to lead so yeah to be honest Vixens did come out of left field but I was so excited and so happy to be given that opportunity so yeah it was absolutely amazing to come over to Melbourne. I don't want to backpedal too much but in terms of your time at the fever as someone watching on and I ask a lot of the girls I interview this same question, is it hard when you're in a team dynamic and while you were there, Janelle, I guess, was the main goal shooter, right? Your predominant position, although you play a lot of goal attack, is goal shooter. Is that right? Like, Do you prefer to play shooter? Um, I think it depends on the requirements for the team. Obviously, I'm happy to do whatever is required for the team. No, give and- me that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I I think um, the the chance for me to learn goal attack was really <laughs> was really exciting, yep. and I wanted to branch out of side of that. Yeah, totally. Historically speaking, goal shooter is definitely where I've played a lot of my netball. Um, but I think when you enter this kind of new era of netball, it's not just one position anymore. And I think that's what we've noticed over the last couple of years. We've noticed. People no longer are just a, a one-position player. They're a multi-position player and for very good reason as well. And I think that was, for me, that's kind of change I needed to be able to develop. And I hadn't really played goal attack at all. So I needed to actually learn how to play that a bit better and, and find my strides in that position as well. But I guess, yeah, to answer your question, goal shoot is probably where I feel most at home. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy playing goal attack at all. I still love playing out there. Yeah, of course. Is there an element of frustration knowing that within yourself, your best position where you can execute your skills best is probably goal shooter. And because there's someone who the coach prefers or for whatever reason plays more at that position than you, is there a part of you that's sitting there going, I want to get my opportunity. And yes, I get on a goal attack, 
but that's still not suited to my style. Do you know what I mean? Like, is there an element of that in a team dynamic where you obviously get along with everyone? Well, I guess it's like any job. Maybe you don't get along with everyone, but you know what I mean? Like, you want everyone to do well, but then you you want court time over someone else who could be a good friend. Is that hard to yeah. work with? Um, I think it's just the dynamics of sport, and I think sport's pretty brutal and can be really brutal at times. And if you want to... Um, succeed you have to adapt and be really flexible and I think part of that for me personally is being able to play two positions and yes growing up playing shooter was my preferred position and for you know everyone I would say in the SSN competition court time is 100% what you're trying to do and you're trying to be the best possible athlete you can be so if you can do that in the position that you feel most comfortable in of course that's going to feel a lot better um I have no grudges or um, any bad comments towards other players who may be in the same position um, on the court as me or to any staff who've, you know, you know, helped me develop my game and goal attack or um, maybe kind of push me more towards that area of the court more so than shooter. Um, it's also not that I don't play shooter at all in a training session. Um, I still develop that connection and role with other people. So um, obviously in the games, probably in the last few years, I've definitely played more of that goal attack role, but by no means am I not training in that goal shooter position as well. It's just what gets put out there on the, on the day. And I just want to clarify, I'm not trying to get you to make any inflammatory comments, but I just, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like a local sport, it's such a big thing. Like if you're playing in the twos and you want to play in the ones and the midfielder or the whatever sport you're playing, whatever position, you might be like, ah, oh, bloody John, I hope he gets injured. Cause he, you know what I mean? Like, I just find it fascinating. It's, yeah, it's really different. Um, and I can 100% relate as well to people who are in that position when they're growing up and, you know, really wanting to get the opportunity in a position or you know, trying to play in a high level for whatever reason. Um, and I think, yeah, it can be difficult, but I think if you can show how flexible and adaptable you are and open to wanting to learn and be a better player, and maybe that's taking a slightly different route to begin with and, and playing in a different position or playing in a different team. Um, but ultimately with your goal and I think just communicating with people that that's what you want to achieve is really important as well so they can help bring you back to that um, at the end of the day but yeah it's not an easy task to maneuver and it's um it's taken me on a different journey with my netball but I wouldn't change it for the world it's been fantastic mate what an attitude (laughs) Kaylee do you know how big um netball the netball community is on twitter uh, it's definitely grown, I would say that. It's pretty, yeah, significant, I would say. Yes. Okay, good. So um, I enact the help every episode of one of my netball friends on Twitter. Her name is Georgia. And I get her to ask my guest a question. So I will share my screen with you and play the question from Georgia. Let's see. You can see that screen, even though it's black. I can. Yeah, yes, okay, yes, yep. <laughs> Hi, Kalia. Hi, Tommy. It's Georgia here. Um, Kalia, my question for you today is what was the harder adjustment? Was it moving to a Melbourne Vixens team that lost three of their attacking players or was it adjusting to Melbourne's weather? Thank you. <laughs> very fun um, question. Very, very good question. Um, I feel like I have transitioned to Melbourne really really well and really really quickly as well I did not have any issues I think the support network that I have in Melbourne has been absolutely amazing and um yeah kind of allowed me to slot in um, which is why I'm staying in Melbourne as well for next year and going forward so that's good obviously a good sign Melbourne's had it on me um even through COVID but Melbourne weather far out very, very intense. Is it what, Don't even know what you're going to get. Is it what you thought it was going to be going there? Like, you know how everyone says, oh, four seasons in one day. Were well, you like, oh, it can't be that bad. No, I, I did know that because I've been to Melbourne enough times to know. But there was one particular day, I think in August, when um, we'd come back from everything and I was just hanging around at home and I literally could not believe how sunny it was in the morning and then we had hail about two hours <laughs> later. And then there was a huge gust of wind because there's this big tree near where we live. And that was just going crazy. And then next thing you know, there was like thunder or something in the background. I was like, I should understand what's happening. Like, what is what has gone on today? This is just silly. It is crazy. Now, I did ask before we started recording because you are wearing like a, what are we calling that? Cardigan? 
I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cardi B, you can call me. Yeah. <laughs> right. So even though you're back in Perth, maybe you took the Melbourne weather with you. Has anyone made that I joke so. yet? Oh no, they haven't. But um, thanks for bringing it up. You're like, welcome. Whatever. No. <laughs> no, it's definitely been a little bit overcast. We've had a couple of days of sun, uh, which has been fantastic. But yeah. I'm in a cardigan. I've got a long sleeve top on. I mean, I've really honed into the Melbourne weather. <laughs> you really have. So, Kelly, let's talk about the season. Like, how did you feel the season went for you? Um, I think it was interesting. I was very intrigued to see how I would go. Obviously, um, touching on George's question, we did have a couple of people go down. Didn't exactly help our situation. Um, and personally, it's the strongest and fittest I've ever been, um, at all. And I found that really, um, confidence boosting for me. I think the other part was that it was a huge learning curve going to another state when you don't understand any of the dynamics and you don't understand the team dynamics. Um, there's all the kind of little things that go on behind the scenes that you're just not sure of whether that's just who do you contact for certain things, who's your support network within the team, within the, you know, management and staff and that kind of thing. Who do you go to for which things? And those little things and little one percenters, I guess, kind of add up and can, you know, make it quite interesting and challenging. So navigating that space initially was probably a bit of a whirlwind. Once I settled into Melbourne life and all of those kind of things, I think I found my groove a bit and probably towards the back end of the season, performance-wise is where I saw my strongest uh, performances come out. Um, Probably that, game against the Sunshine Coast Lightning was a highlight for me and I was really proud of that performance as well. But definitely took me a while to find my groove with the girls and um, just understanding what my style is as well. And I think that's something other people would have um, or could resonate, I guess, with as well, is that it's easy to kind of go off other people's styles from what you see around you, but trying to find your own style and know how that fits into the the players and, and what their strengths are as well is something that I had to really um, adapt to and and learn quite quickly, which initially was quite challenging for me. So I'm usually a holding shooter, like you said, and to go out and play goal attack and use my height to my advantage in that goal attack position um, was something I hadn't necessarily done pre like previous to that moment because Janiel is a holding shooter and I have um, I had MJ behind me most of the time. Um, and so working with her, she'd come out of the circle quite, circle quite a lot. So it was a completely different dynamic in that regard. So yeah, a little bit, a little bit different, but overall I would, I'd give myself a relatively good report card. Do you think the average fan understands how hard that is when you've played in a system that has a certain dynamic of the way the team plays and the team structure to going to a new team, which was successful last year, but as mm. Georgia mentioned, well, we didn't mention their names, but Tegan left, Caitlin left, and then Lizzie was injured. So you had Kate sometimes playing wing attack. You had Hannah playing wing attack, who hadn't even played in that team before. So I guess that front end was completely new and no one really knew how it was going to work. Do you think that's underestimated? Because there's only a certain amount of hours you can train in the day, right? Like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, it was. Yeah, sorry, sorry I didn't cut you off. No, no, no I had no way. I was just rambling. <laughs> no, I just, I think it's not that people don't understand. I think there's an appreciation for how much um, goes on behind the scenes. I think there's definitely an appreciation for that. But I think the capacity for for the netball fans out there who don't understand what we do behind the scenes, just to get up for game day. I don't think there's that understanding and I don't think it's really easy for me to explain that either without you actually experiencing that. Um, To have things happen when they did was probably the hardest part, if not the actual um, outcome of that. So when we we lose players through retirement or through injury, that's to be expected in any and really any team, I would say. But it's the timing of when that happens. And for us, we had Liz go down incredibly close to the start of the season which presented us with a huge opportunity for Hannah but what it did do as well is provide us with not a lot of time to connect with someone who we hadn't spent that much time over the course of pre-season obviously we have the training partners come in and um, they're engaged in our program and that kind of thing but not to the same level as someone who obviously is in that 10 um, because 
just through the nature of they're going to be a training partner versus actually in the in the team. Yeah. Um. So yeah, those kind of things can be really challenging, and I I don't know whether everyone understands the backstory of that. But at the same time, as a professional athlete, that's part of your job to get on with things and get going. And yeah, it's going to be challenging and hard at times, but you just have to keep finding a way, really. Something that I'm really intrigued about is the mindset. So say if you've played a game where your performance is not what you would expect of yourself and say you haven't shot as well as you know you can, how do you then approach training and what kind of... What kind of conversations are you having with yourself when in a game you might not have played well, but you know you're good enough to play the level? You know you can shoot. Can you take me inside your mind and those conversations you have with yourself? Yeah, so I think initially off the back of that kind of performance, you're looking at probably the negative self-talk, which can spiral and, you know, you need to catch yourself before it gets too low like yes it's okay to have those kind of thoughts and you know be really unhappy with the performance because you have these high standards and for myself personally I do have really really high standards for myself uh, which can at times be frustrating when you want to live up to those expectations that you set regardless of anyone else around you and those external um, motivators but then you need to quickly move on and you know for the back end of the season, we had games that were two days apart, three days apart, which is a huge change from going from one game a week where you've got a huge amount of time to stew over it, to go through footage, to go through conversations with staff, um, you know, your specific coach and also um, other teammates and kind of nut those things out. You don't necessarily have that time. So you have to move on quite quickly. So you go from that short term, oh, that sucks, mm, didn't do as well as I wanted to, to being like, hey, let's go to the next time. We can't actually change what's happened in the past. Or we can only change what happens in the future. And we can make those changes small or big, but working about setting little goals for the week. So maybe it's the first training session of the week after that kind of performance. It's going to the post for me as a shooter a little bit earlier and putting up more goals or maybe it's when we do a bit of match play or we do a bit of match simulation, center pass, back line, whatever it is, long court, that we actually, you know, personally work through a couple of little goals that you can kind of build that confidence back up internally and say, look, yeah, I didn't have that great a performance, but that doesn't define me and it's not going to define me for the rest of the season. It's one performance. And I think an analogy you could probably use is that people talk about having a bad day. And it could be only 10 o'clock in the morning. They're like, oh, I'm having the worst day ever. But when you think about it, you've still got the rest of the day to make that a good day. It might just be that little bit in the morning. So it's actually having a bad moment or a bad, um, you know, half of the day and just moving forward from that and saying, look, the rest of the day can be amazing. It doesn't have to be a bad day just because we've had a bad morning. So approaching that kind of same mentality from a game perspective as well and saying that it was one performance, it's not the defining performance of your life. Yes, there's other opportunities for you to be getting back out there and showing what you can do. I love your outlook and attitude. You seem quite analytical. Is that some a way you've always approached your nepal? Um, I would say yes. I think it's developed over my time as a netballer, but I think initially um, the bones of it probably comes back to being a little bit more analytical. Yeah. So you mentioned before we talked before that. Next year, you're staying in Melbourne. Now, you're playing with Hawks, yeah. Nepal, and the VNL? Yes. You don't seem the vibe I'm getting. Like, you seem so excited to stay in Melbourne, so excited to play with Hawks. And I guess an onlooker might be like, well, I would assume you would be disappointed not playing Super Netball, but it seems like you've got a lot of other things going on in life. Can you yeah. talk to me about yeah. that? <laughs> um. Yeah, of course, obviously. I'm very much an open book and I'm very, like, you know, very happy to have chats to people. And, um, yeah, I, I'm not someone to shy away from a conversation. And I think for me, I've been really open in saying how excited I am and happy to be in Melbourne and, and living there. And I just feel like it's such a fantastic opportunity for me. Something I'm really excited about is continuing that, whatever that happens to be. And I think, um, yes, I am off the back of not getting a contract, I am disappointed. Um, it's a different kind of disappointment to when I left FIFA, though. 
because I spent seven years at one club. I had a huge amount of friends and, you know, I developed the family within that, within that team. And I've got some of my closest friends. I've got my best friends from that team. Um, and I have such a great relationship with them. And yeah, it was really, really brutal and really difficult. It was almost like ripping a bandaid for me. Um, and that was probably the catalyst that initiated such change. Um, and then coming over to Melbourne, it was a bit of a fresh start for me. And I've been really, really excited by that. And to continue that, continue that netball in whatever capacity is just something I'm really looking forward to. And um, I had an injury at the end of the season this year, which wasn't ideal. Um, but I guess for me, I just want to get back out there and play netball and I want to get back out there and, and have some fun. And yes, I, I didn't get a contract and yes, that's disappointing. And I would really love to be back playing SSN, but the positive outlook of it is that I still get to play netball and I still get to be able to be a part of a club and really bring what I can and use my strengths to that club on and off the court and, and hopefully kind of, you know, help the next generation of netballers or people who are looking to enter that pathway and, and yeah, provide that opportunity for them as well. Mate, you're such a ray of sunshine. Oh, my God. Your outlook <laughs> on everything is so lovely. So what are you going to be doing outside of netball in Melbourne? Yeah, so I'm currently working for Netball Victoria. I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator, and I've been working with them part-time throughout the year and then gone full-time as of October. So I'm with them to the end of the year. Post that, I don't actually have anything on the horizon. Um, so I'm looking at anything in that nutrition health promotion space. Um, I love working in that space and I have huge passion for it as well. Diversity and inclusion, obviously, as well. Um, really passionate about that and, and just love the work I'm doing at the moment in Netball Victoria, so anything along those lines. Um, I've got a really good family network, which I've, well, I'm calling my, my family, but they're actually just some friends of mine's family. I've just ingrained myself with them. Um, they had no real choice, to be honest. But, um, yes, yeah, so I'll be spending Christmas over in Victoria and, yeah, that's pretty much it. Mate, that's so surprising. How big was the pool to go back to Perth? next year um yeah it was it was it's a hard decision I probably this year have realized I really want to like stay a bit longer in Melbourne I don't feel like I've really explored enough both professionally and personally um so I really wanted to extend that and then coming back to Perth at the moment has been an absolute game changer for me I am really really close to family um and have a really good relationship with them, so I wanted to make sure I could get back and see them. So I surprised them, spent two weeks in quarantine and ended up surprising them. They had no idea. That was great um, content. I, and- I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have so many more videos which I haven't put out there. Um, but, yeah, I, I surprised them. They were both crying and stuff like that. So I'm really close to them and just wanted to be able to see them and also my friends as well um, who I haven't seen in a really, really long time. But I – want to keep going with my journey over in Melbourne and yes, um, Perth is home and will always be home to me. But for, for now, I think my next step needs to be in Melbourne and um, yeah, I've, I've got a boyfriend over there and I've got family support, um, you know, extended friends, that kind of thing. So for me, I just want to be able to keep going in Melbourne. Mate, I'm so disappointed that my time at Netball Vic didn't overlap with you because you seem like <laughs> such a great positive person. Um, I really appreciate the time you've given me today and I know I speak for a lot of other netball fans when I say that we look forward to following your journey uh, with the Hawks in 2022. But Kaylee Stanton, thanks so much for taking us behind the bib. Thank you and thanks so much for having me and um, if you see me around Melbourne, don't be afraid to come say hi. Hopefully I'm not a... uh too scary person to come and talk to. Yes, I'm tall, but you know, you just call me the BFG (laughs) and I'll be there. Mate, what night's... What nights? VNL Wednesday nights. Yes, Wednesday nights. Wednesday, Wednesday nights. Hawks Prem. Go check it out. Yep. Come. Come watch. <laughs>